right. Well, thank you very much for that uh, inspiring presentation. It's one of the many reasons I'm so proud to work at a company like Salesforce, where uh, equality and philanthropy is a key part of our business model. So I'm Alex, as uh, the other Alex mentioned. Uh, delighted to be here with you. Thank you for coming uh, to our offices. One of my favorite pictures of Salesforce is actually, uh, to, the, to Tom's point about the email, a picture of Mark Benioff back in 98 when he was just starting Salesforce in the proverbial garage. It was actually his apartment. Um, so there is hope for uh, owning a tower named after your company name 18 years later. So um, just shortly about us, uh, about eight years ago, Salesforce started investing. Uh, Salesforce Ventures, as the name implies, is the venture capital arm of Salesforce. We've been very active, uh, portfolio of about 165 companies all over the world. Uh, here in Europe, we've set up a $100 million fund focused on Series A, B, and C companies uh, in the enterprise B2B SaaS uh, space. We're delighted to have Dimitri as one of our portfolio companies, but if you're doing anything uh, in SaaS and you think Salesforce can be helpful on the cap table, uh, we'd love to hear about uh, your business. So without further ado, uh, let me quickly introduce the panel and then we'll get um, over some questions. R reminder that you can also, uh, at some point, we'll have Slido up here. So if you want to ask questions, uh, please do. Uh, and we'd love to hear from the audience. So uh, Dimitri is the founder and CEO of a business called Digital Genius. Um, next to Dimitri is uh, Sorry, James Osmond from Triptease and John from User Replay. So why don't we start off by saying a few words about uh, what your business does and a bit about your background, then we'll, we'll kick into questions. Hi, my name is Dimitri. I'm founder and CEO at Digital Genius. We built artificial intelligence products for customer service automation. We're a Salesforce Ventures portfolio company and App Exchange partner as well, a supporter of Pledge 1%. Uh, so uh, really, really great to be here. Hello, James Osmond. Um, I'm COO uh, of Triptees and run the uh, EMEA business. Um, at Triptees, we help hotels get more direct bookings. It's something they're desperately in need of. And so uh, we provide a technology platform that enables them to get much more conversion on their websites and get more happy direct bookers. Good evening. I'm John Thompson. I'm CEO of a Series A stage business called User Replay. Uh, we help people with transactional websites sell more stuff by trying to find the segments of users that are struggling, essentially. So, you know, when you've been on a website trying to buy something and you're really annoyed, you don't know what to do next, we, we find those people and help make websites uh, better. It's actually my second SaaS business. I did a procurement platform um, between 2001 and 2008. And timing sounds like it was everything with the, uh, the exit and, and multiples between SaaS and not, but we can talk about that over beers. <laughs> um, so why don't we start with you, John? I mean, uh, you, you've um, raised funding from most of the UK investors. Um, talk a little bit about the advice and experience you have. I don't know how many first-time entrepreneurs we have. It was clearly your second business. Uh, but just share a little bit about you know, what you went through, uh, how you thought about who actually to invite into the company, uh, and what advice you'd have for first-time entrepreneurs. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and uh, it's amazing how the ecosystem in London has got massively better since uh, I first raised money in 2001 in the kind of nuclear winter after the, the tech bust. And it was really, really hard, and SaaS was a, just a really unknown concept. Unfortunately, I managed to get through fundraising and exit before the market worked out SaaS companies should be really, really valuable, but uh, uh, so that was uh, slightly bad timing. But yeah, I mean, I think... Um, the, the ecosystem here is is very good now, uh, and it's a good place to raise. Uh, it's a good place to raise money. Um, I think if you're in B two B SaaS, it's good to get as far as you can before you raise any money. Really, make sure you've got people with experience of um, of, of selling B two B, and also try and get a couple of customers, and that creates enormous credibility compared with an idea. But I think, uh, and I'm a big believer in big seed rounds. I think seed has got. Uh, more more easier than the other stages uh, over the last 10 years. And in my experience, and, I, and I'm sure my colleagues here uh, have always grown faster and more easier, but it always takes longer than you think. So I'm a big fan of the big seed round. I think you can do quite a big seed round now um, in London. And, uh, and, and why not do it? You know, optimize to be successful overall. Um, I was talking to a fellow entrepreneur who was, who was just getting really stressed about whether to raise that extra sort of 200k and my advice is always well, why wouldn't you why wouldn't you do that you know the number of people I know who've run out of money compared to the number of people I know who've been crying because they only made 8 million instead of 9 million um, is quite low so uh, wait till you've uh, wait till, you know I raised too much in my first business and it just meant I had seven years of not being stressed 
uh, and, and, and made very slightly less money at the end. So uh, uh, wait till you've proven it a bit and then go and, go and raise more than you think you need would be uh, my advice. And, uh, and, and London's a great place to raise now, I think. So on the uh, rich versus king scale, we know, we know where you're, you fall, which is why you've chosen venture-backed business. <laughs> not every entrepreneur feels that way. Obviously, some you know, are not suited for VC capital and are only, you know, would rather take their time and bootstrap, but you're saying yeah. kind of get, get to a place where you believe in what you've got and then raise uh, to, to double down on that. Right. And, and, and it's not always right. The very first startup I was involved with, which sadly I didn't own a big chunk of, but that bootstrapped up to a 40 million pre-money valuation and about $15 million of, uh, of revenue and then did one round, sold two years later. So there's loads of different ways to, uh, to do it. But yeah, I, I think... Um, don't involve anybody else's money till you're really sure and you've got some proof yourself. And, and once you've got that, uh, go for it. The, uh, for those who don't know, by the way, the, the rich versus king trade-off is a, a Harvard professor's term for, you know, as a founder, would you rather own 1% of 100 or 100% of 1? Those are both the same financial outcomes, but certain people are wired to prefer um, those two setups. Uh, James, I think you had a comment. I was just going to say, I remember um, when we closed our first part of our Series A, uh, being in a meeting room, and we got the check through, we had a, you know, looking at it and sort of screaming with delight, and then sort of, it literally dawned on us in the same meeting that we hadn't raised enough money, and we needed to go back out to our investors, one of whom is here, uh, and start talking again about, actually, could we double that? And it was another three months of talking and going through the process, so I completely agree with John, you need to raise as much as possible. Um, I'm actually at a stage where we're hopefully going to close a Series B this week, um, so I found the last four months of this process really fascinating because I, my, my one bit of advice would be um, it's, it's really about being clear who you are and being true to yourself. So we had an experience where we went to see one investor in London and we presented our plan. It was all really good and the metrics looked great and all the rest of it. And they, uh, they were very excited. And then after a bit of reflection, they came back and said, you know, we really like you. We love your business and it's doing really well. Uh, but we just think you're too ambitious. We think you want to hire too many people too quickly. And actually, we would invest if you hired less people. Uh, and we, you know, we're so tempted because they're a good business, good brand, and we'd like to get them involved. So we decided, you know, okay, that was interesting. They're out. Next day, so 24 hours later, I went to see another VC. Same sort of thing. Fantastic business. Metrics were awesome. But I can see how you can get to be 500 million, probably a billion. But how do you get to two billion? I can't see how you get there. So you know, we're not interested. And it's just, you go from those incredible extremes of, you know, one wants you to slow down, one wants you to go fast, <coughs> faster. And actually, the thing I learned from that was the really important thing is to work out what's right for you. You know, who are the right partners for the business you're building, the pace you want to go at, uh, the kind of team you want to go, you know, to build around you, and who's got the right sort of destination in terms of what you're trying to create as an organization. Um, and I think going in, or at least having, spending a bit of time being clear about that as you go into a Series A and a Series B, is actually just going to lead to a much happier board and a much more constructive relationship. So the importance of alignment with your investor and kind of having the same view for what the business can become and, you know, a long-term partner to that growth. Yeah. I mean, we were tempted to sort of start changing our plan to just to fit in with the desires of certain VCs and then just think, what are we doing? Um, so, yeah, I think it's really important, that alignment. Life's short. You might as well build the business you want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and, and Dimitri, curious, get your perspectives uh, really on two things. You know, it sounds like there's consensus around raising more than uh, you might want because it takes time. And also in geography, we haven't really talked about that, but you raised, even though your business is based here in the UK, you've raised mostly from US-based investors. Maybe talk about those two things. Yep. Um, so for us, uh, as a business, people always come first. It's very important uh, to hire the right people and to surround the business with the right people, uh, with the right investors who truly understand the, this business model, who truly understand your ambition and where you want to be. Uh, so that is the, uh, one of the primary reasons why we uh, went out to the U.S. The pool of investors uh, uh, there who operated B2B SaaS companies who understand this business model and who think big enough to scale to $100 million ARR, billion dollars ARR is, is just much, much bigger than, than uh, we found in Europe. Um, when raising in the US, it was essential, at least for one of our co-founders, one of our team members, to relocate to the US and to, to, to establish a proper presence there. Uh, we don't see many companies being backed by US VCs who don't have 
a physical presence uh, in the States or one of the key team members of working from there. And uh, in general, um, uh, what, we, what we observed is that a lot more um, uh, partners, a lot more firms in, 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 in the US uh, are just willing to support the company uh, throughout, well, to, to kind of support the company throughout the life cycle uh, to truly uh, buy into the vision and help the company grow uh, through multiple series of funding. Um, you felt there was a, a bit different perspectives, I guess, for the business that you were trying to raise around that? Uh, from, uh, from kind of what you were, what, did yeah. you meet investors in the UK yeah, or did you kind of bypass that and go straight to the US? We met investors in the UK and uh, I think a lot of uh, UK VCs, are, uh, they have a more of a generalist approach. Uh, they um, invest in B2C and B2B, uh, while in the US you have more firms who are specifically focused on uh, B2B and building type of companies uh, that, that we want to build. Got it, got it. Uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I first moved to London about 12 years ago, and, and back then, being a B2B entrepreneur was the least sexy thing in the world. Uh, it seems to have changed a lot. Every entrepreneur we meet now, uh, it, it seems, regardless of what kind of business they're building, has AI and machine learning uh, in, in the pitch deck, for, for better or for worse. But uh, I think it is starting to change, and certainly there's more VCs um, funding that gap and, and, and really dedicated sector funds uh, trying, to, trying to fix that imbalance. Um, cu curious, I guess, from, from the panel, anything you do differently? You know, now that you've kind of seen that experience firsthand, maybe in your first or second company, uh, do you wish, looking back, oh man, uh, you know, other than raising more than I would have liked, hey, I, I wish someone had told me that? <laughs> uh, just patience. You've got to kiss a lot of frogs. Um, I think it's and to, we, we spoke to lots of VCs in the US as well. Um, but again, I think it was the sort of being it helped us work out who we wanted to be and who we wanted to work with because, again, they said, So we assume you're going to move your headquarters to America and actually built a great team in the UK. And kind of going, Well, um, actually, now you mention it, no. Um, so I think, I think having it would have been better to have gone through that process in advance and therefore sped up the process because we were clearer about the right kind of profile of VC to talk to. Yeah, that's helpful. And I think for entrepreneurs, I mean, uh, how, how many, I mean, maybe you don't want to say, but uh, maybe you can both share just roughly how many VC meetings you had before getting to a term sheet. At least 40. Four zero. No, we had 60 and, uh, for, for the first round, but then it got easier. And one of the learnings is that it's, it's quite dangerous to constantly be in the fundraising mode. Uh, it just takes... Uh, it takes away all of your time, so uh, the best strategy is to set a specific time frame, uh, maintain the relationships in the meantime, but when you're raising, just give it uh, a month or two months with clear start and clear end date and uh, go on the road show, uh, invest 100% of your time into, into this process, but the rest of the time focus on building the company. Yeah, I think longer gaps between rounds are always good. Um, so you can actually focus on generating value. So uh, that's some, something I've learned is uh, certainly to do that. And uh, I've always taken the view that, you know, stop when you've got a handful of term sheets. You know, you definitely need more than one, but don't just keep going on and on and on. It's really easy to go from six term sheets to naught and really annoy everybody. So uh, you need more than one. I, I always think three is a good number. Um, and then choose who you want to, you know, put your investors under a bit of pressure to show them that there's competitive tension, get it closed quickly and get on with building the business. But yeah, in contrast, I did about 15 meetings um, rather than uh, 60. So I don't want to hear about your valuations in case they were <laughs> really, really much better. But uh, uh, you've got to realize there's a cost in, there's a cost of, there's, a, there's an opportunity cost to doing 60 meetings um, and, and knowing that point when to stop and, uh, and close the process down is, is, a, is a key judgment call, I think. So, so I guess as a VC, tenacity is one of the things you look for. <laughs> Building a company is hard, and you know, not taking no for an answer is, is one way to, to prove that. And one piece of advice I'll, I'll quickly share, and I probably shouldn't be saying this, but you know, if you are going to have 15, for whatever the number is, meetings, maybe don't pick the, the VC firm that you're most interested with to start. 
So fund, fundraising is, and pitching really is a, is a skill. Uh, I'm sure every meeting you had, you got better at it, and you kind of hear what questions people have. And then by the fifth or sixth interaction, all of a sudden you're, uh, you're much more in the flow. And I think uh, there's a noticeable difference. And a lot of times, and for better or for worse, you know, VCs will meet 3,000 companies in a year, and uh, you kind of get one shot at the first meeting and that first impression. So uh, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about international expansion, uh, different offices, different cultures. All three of you, you know, after raising funding, have now expanded uh, to other parts of the world. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what that's been like. Um, you know, who, who set up that initial office? Dimitri mentioned he had a co-founder. Uh, and what's that been like uh, from a cultural perspective, just managing uh, a second office? Yeah, I mean, it's all about America, isn't it? Much as we'd like to uh, think it's all about the UK, it really isn't. And um, getting a return on a B2B investment is, is all about being American and thinking American. So uh, although we, we happily raise money here, um, we, you know, significantly over 50% of our sales came from the US quite quickly. Our website's always been in American English. And actually, I've hired um, a COO who also runs the customer-facing aspects of our EMEA business, because I think that's trying to create something of an American culture around the whole business, which is really, uh, is, is really important. In all likelihood, one day we'll all get bought by an American uh, business. So I just think think as, think as American as possible, um, you know, go there often and, and establish a good team there. I mean, what we did is we were fortunate in that a competitor got bought and then towards the end of, you know, they, they had a retention program which lasted a defined amount of time and then we were able to pretty much grab the, the whole team. Uh, and that was a really super efficient way of doing it. You don't always get that opportunity, but, you know, they know each other. Um, and you know they haven't if they haven't killed each other in the last five or six years they're probably not going to in in the next few years so that was really helpful to us although they came with a culture and a way of working together which was distinct to the to the one in the UK and I think we've we've tried to merge it together as I say by having senior leader leadership in the US from quite an early uh, stage and you know all our customers contract with our US subsidiary not a single one of them has ever asked for a parent ca company guarantee or even considered that the UK might be head office. It's, a, it's amazing, really. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, be, be, as, be as American as possible, as early as possible. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, in my whole business, so I, I'd started another business before this, um, it was a global marketing consultancy. We made all our money in America. It's, it's just an amazing place. Because you, know, you can just get scale so quickly. Um, we started our office in New York, within three months of getting our first customer in the UK. Um, my brother who started the business moved over to New York to help try and accelerate that, and that's when I joined and started running Amir and, and, and the rest of the business. Um, it's been really, really important. The, the thing that's really tricky is building those two cultures, or getting one culture across those two different offices. Um, and uh, I, the only thing I can think of that really matters about it is when you're trying to build that one culture, it's not about managing it, it's just about investing, investing hard into that culture to get that real teamwork going on. Um, and uh, just to sort of make that tangible, uh, so every Christmas we seem to run out of money. And uh, for the last two years, when we are back, you know, cash balance is you know, dropping down to a slightly exciting stage, um, both times we've brought the whole team from New York over to, first of all, Barcelona and then Paris, because we thought it's so important to invest in our team, meeting face-to-face, -face, most of whom never met each other, to get time together, because that will lead to much more proper teamwork. And it happened in Christmas again this year, um, and it'll probably happen again next year. Uh, but it's just a really important way to sort of demonstrate that you actually believe in creating one single culture. Um, and I think whether it's doing that or investing in um, sort of training programs or you know, cut values that you're trying to to drive and how you onboard people and what performance management looks like, all those sort of things, um, I think you have to invest quite heavily in, in order to build the right culture across those two different offices. Otherwise, it becomes, everyone fights otherwise. Yeah, um, in, in our case, uh, uh, the, uh, the US, op US office was open fairly early. My co-founder um, is, is American. He, he used to run his own business and then he exited to join Digital Genius. Uh, and uh, it helped us a lot to, uh, uh, to grow as fast as we did uh, by connecting us to the right partner, uh, by assembling the right ecosystem around us, the right advisors, um, 
And uh, the only challenge that it brings uh, um, at early stages is that culture component. And it's a good challenge to have. Uh, it, the culture doesn't come as a given when you have two offices. You really do have to spend time by over communicating all the time, by organizing offsites, uh, by writing documents that outline the values that you have in the company, the principles that you operate with. And this structure uh, helps you to kind of build a much stronger culture long term. And they, by, by virtue of having two offices, you have to do it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really a positive thing for a company to do. That, that's great to hear, and I, I guess we're a little biased, but I love that all three of you talked about going global and the importance of that, because it's something we see a lot, and we'll meet companies where amazing idea, great team, and for one reason or another, they just kind of want to stay in their home market, and it's, you know, we question a little bit, how can you build a really big business when, uh, and the beauty about SaaS is that you can go global very early on, as opposed to kind of a more lo local marketplace model, so <laughs> glad you guys said that. Um, let's see, we've got a, a few questions here. Um, let's see which one we'll pick. Um, this, this is an interesting one, just from a timing and, and tactical in terms of kind of when you go to the U.S. Uh, and kind of when you hire that first salesperson. I'm sure um, several folks, you can't see the question, so I'll read it off. If the U.S. is more than 50% of revenue, uh, how early do you hire there? And what kind of MRR were you at? So perhaps um, you know, I'll share some two cents from a VC perspective, but maybe talk about uh, you know, how, how early did uh, Mikhail make the move? Yep. Um, it was uh, uh, just as we started commercializing in the UK, so a couple of months after we started, uh, um, one, once the product was uh, validated in the UK, we, we opened up a US, a US office. So it was very, very early on. Uh, we didn't have US revenues back then. We, have interest, we had interest from US clients, um, but that was enough of a validation for us. Yeah, I think if, generally if you want to go fast, you need to do everything early and earlier than feels comfortable. Um, so we had a, a two or three co-founders in London. Two of them basically moved over to New York to go and get that business going. So that was relatively risky to go do that. Um, and that just then really helped the whole business take off. In my two businesses, it's been different. The first time I just went straight away, we didn't even have a prospective customer. And it was a bit of a nightmare, really, because the quality of salespeople we could get on that basis were, was, turned out to be not that great. Um, second time round, we actually sold our first seven hundred thousand dollars worth of deals and our first six enterprise customers over for, over the phone from the UK, um, and that was such a better basis for hiring quality salespeople. It's like, come on, if I can do seven hundred k after we put the kids to the bed to bed on the phone, imagine what you can do. You, you know, you you uh, rock and roll sales hero, um, and uh, we just got way better people. So I think. Um, you can do it too early because the, uh, you know, the market for, for good sales talent in, in the U.S. is very, very tight. Um, so have enough evidence um, it can be a good thing. Um, so, yeah, those are my two experiences of it for what they're worth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it's very different, I guess, business to business. But one thing we've seen work very well is, especially with enterprise sales, is when one of the customers drags you into the U.S. So, you know, you sell into, I don't know, a big bank, uh, let's say Barclays in, in the UK, and they happen to have a presence in the US and that beachhead kind of establishes. Is that, is that been, I see a lot of heads nodding. So is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, that's great when, uh, great when that happens. And I think some, you know, inbound interest. We, so we had quite a bit of inbound interest from the US and having had a bad experience the first time, um, we were a bit cautious about it. So you know, we got to the point where we were saying, well, if you trade under UK law and you don't mind that you won't get any support and you don't mind this, and you, don't, you know, we were almost, and they kept saying, no, we, we still want to talk. And at that point, we realized there really was some latent demand that wasn't being fulfilled locally for, for what we did. And then we, then we kind of pounced on it. So uh, I think getting dragged in is a good way of saying it, either, either through a, a UK K, um, multinational or having a customer who, who really seems to have a strong interest. Um, but it's, you know, it's hard to go in if it's completely cold. Right, so let's see. We've got a couple more questions. Uh, why don't we say... All right, so this is an interesting one. We'll take uh, Dom's question around, um, so excited about raising capital at all. Uh, series funding, uh, is that... Uh, I'm not sure if that's series seed or what, what that refers to, but uh, this is just debt and pressure on KPIs and stress. 
why not concentrate on profit? I mean, I guess this goes back to the question around, um, you know, you can build a, a profitable business with a relatively small capital base, maybe only do a small amount of funding and then get to profitability, be masters of your own destiny, never have to deal with 60 uh, annoying VCs. Uh, just maybe talk a little bit about that. Well, I think the, the um, simplest answer is, well, you may think that's a good idea, but there'll be some other dudes who don't and they'll raise $50 million and kill you. All right, then. That was easy. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, this, the talk of today was also around uh, building a sales team. And, you know, we'll kind of turn on to that a little bit and switch gears because I'd love to hear. There's a lot of uh, collective experience here on hiring that sales team. And, you know, I can hear a bit of war stories and the way you're talking about mistakes that have happened. Um, may, maybe just share one best practice each that you found when hiring that sales team, whether it's an interview question you really like, uh, a, a kind of certain profile that you look for, uh, or even just knowing in your business when's the right time to kind of step on that gas. J John, do you want to start us off? Yeah, a really simple thing to do is just to ask the salesperson what their targets were in each of the three years and what they achieved against that target, and they'll tell you. And then ask them to, to see their um, P60s, or I think pink slips they're called in the US, and that will reveal a whole lot, and you'll be able to sort of, that's a KPI on how much bullshit they, uh, they talk. Um, so that's a, you know, I think you need to find people who can sell and, you know, if they can, there'll be some evidence of, of that, and, and they will be expensive, and you should, you should pay for, a, you know, have fewer, better salespeople, don't have lots of mediocre ones. Um, I'm always amazed at how many people hire salespeople, inside sales reps, who are making phone calls to close deals, who don't get them to phone you to sell something. So this is what they do. You just need to actually get them, hear the pitch. Um, and then the other thing is to tell them why they're crap in that particular pitch, give them really specific feedback, finish the interview, and then get them to pitch to you again. And if they've learned and adapted their pitch based on the feedback you've given them, you know you can coach them to become really, really good and they've got the right attitude. Um, so that's kind of one thing. Uh, and the other is hire an awesome VP or C you know, CSO early. Again, I, I kind of believe in going early. Um, we've had two, uh, so first time I don't think we got it right, second time the guy was really, really great. And if they've got the right attitude and they've got the right experience, and admittedly there aren't that many in Europe who've done it really well, um, it just helps the whole business begin to accelerate because your metrics begin to take off and then you can just do everything else. So um, I think, that, yeah, right talent at the top. It's essential to hire the right person for the, your stage of the company. So um, there, instead of going after a big VP of sales from a publicly traded company, you ideally need to find a person who scaled the organization from, if you're at seed stage, let's say from a million to 30 million uh, multiple times, uh, that is the person who is more likely to, to help you grow than uh, an overachiever at a big company. So the so timing of the hire is the importance of who you hire and also just making sure that there's no bullshit <laughs> around. I didn't know that asking for pink slips is not illegal, but maybe, maybe it is and it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> um, Great. And, uh, today. Yeah, there you go. Well, it might, it might, it might not be. Um, I guess in terms of correcting some mistakes, you know, as much as we try when hiring to get the best people we can, there's always, um, just talk a little bit about that. I mean, one of the frequent things we hear from founders is, oh man, I, I wish I had done that sooner and either move someone on or ramp them up better or train them on. Just what's that tension in your mind in terms of, hey, I need to invest more in this person to ramp them up versus, you know what, I need to make a decision and they're just not right for this culture, this team, this, this company. I think it's very important to spot whether people can scale or not with the company. And the biggest mistake that uh, I've seen multiple times is that a person is good, uh, for, is the right fit for the company when you go from zero to your first million, but then the same person doesn't really scale uh, into the new role uh, from one million to 10 million. So uh, it's, it's very important to spot it early and to have a contingency plan in place uh, to, to address this as soon as possible. Um, I, I think it depends a little bit on what level you're trying to hire for. So for more junior people, I think I always look for, are they industrious? They're going to work damn hard. Um, are they smart and are they hungry to learn? And if they've got those things, then you probably can coach them to become great at whatever role they've, they've chosen. And at a more senior level, I just I think always the defining thing is, do they scare me with how good they could be and how much better they're going to be than I am? And if they have got that, then 
then you know that they're just going to free you up to do more stuff and add more value to the business in other ways. And that's really, really hard because you've got to sort of accept the fact you might not be awesome at everything. I think it's taking corrective action quickly enough as well. I mean, I look, look back on my career and I've given so many people a second chance and uh, out of all of them, I've only had one person who I nearly fired who went on to be brilliant and every single other person gradually gradually got worse. So I think if you're thinking about it, you, you, need, to, you need to do it. I think the other thing that I've learned through much uh, pain and suffering over the years is, you know, there's performance and their behaviours both of them are really important. And actually, as the business scales, behaviors become more and more important. And, you, you, you know, early on, it's just, it's all about performance because it's performance or, or, or death. Um, but if you don't start to manage bad behavior out of the organization as you scale, you get, you get really bad cultural problems. Um, and, and the bigger it is, the more that happens. So that's something that I've, uh, I've learned very painfully. Yeah, it's, I mean, you're all hyper-growth companies. It's one of the biggest challenges we see in our companies is hiring the person that will still fill the role 12 months from now. And by that point, you know, your VP of sales today is not the same functional responsibility as, uh, you know, when they need to manage 12 AEs versus actually doing this, the sales themselves. So um, very hard. Let's see if we've got uh, any, oh, these are all the same ones. Do we have any new questions? Wherever, wherever uh, she went, there she is. Um, let's see. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, other than valuation, what are some of the criteria to use for picking a VC? Or maybe the answer is j you just picked on valuation. <laughs> Great question, and it's uh, really nice to be in a position to to pick from a wide range of choices. That's obviously where you want to be. Um, I think it's all about people, isn't it? You know, you're kind of hiring your VC. It's somebody you're going to work with closely for a number of years the only difference being you can't fire them they can fire you um, so I think the people dynamic is really 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 important and again coming back to you know I had a great time for seven years really enjoyed working with those guys you know and I made 10% less it's a way better use of your most valuable commodity which is years of your life so uh, get to know the people I mean, a tip, um, something that I've done um, in the past is, you know, they'll get, the VC will give you some references, um, call them for sure, and then ask for some references for companies that have gone bust horribly um, after they've invested, and then you'll find out the, the real character of the people involved. Yeah, uh, I think it's all about people. It's about the culture, the alignment when it comes to the vision to share the same vision for the company. Uh, after all, it's a, uh, it's a person uh, who's going to be with you every single day for the next seven or 10 years, perhaps. Uh, perhaps even more. Yeah, if you're lucky, 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's very important to find the right person who you feel comfortable with in good times and bad times. And uh, uh, there are a lot of funds who can write uh, much better term sheet at much better valuation and uh, it's it's a I think it's a big mistake to to go after the big valuation uh, instead of uh, going after the best partner uh, so we, we did sacrifice once um, on the valuation just to get the best person yeah, it's like a, a marriage clause with 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 no divorce the, the other good one I've heard uh, other than companies have gone bust is also I mean this is a bit harder to figure out but companies that the VCs have turned down um, and not invested in, and kind of what, what was that dynamic like? And, yeah. you know, but th that's a bit harder to figure out, but through friends. How are we doing on time? That's it. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, first of all, Alex, for organizing this. Uh, if you haven't been to SaaS Talk, we went last year and we're blown away. So for a SaaS founder, definitely come. But most importantly, thank you to the three of you for sharing such super interesting insights. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.